Let me explain this message this morning before I get started. This is the last Sunday of 2019. It's the last Sunday of a year, the last Sunday of a decade. And so I just was, I started thinking and praying about this last week. I was just thinking, what, what should I preach? This is a special Sunday. It's the very last one. Next Sunday, we'll be starting a new year. Next Sunday, I'm going to be uh, showing you our theme for the year. Oh, I'm excited about our theme for next Sunday. Oh, next year's theme is awesome. Our, our theme this last year, Strong and Courageous, we kept the theme for about a year and a half, actually. I needed it. I needed that theme. This theme, I need as well. This is a theme that God's been working in my heart for over a year, and I'll introduce it to you next week. I know I've, I've uh, told some of you about it here and there, uh, but uh, that's a uh, it was like the, the free preview kind of a thing. I'm excited about it. Be here next Sunday. As we start a, a new year, we'll have a new theme for our church. I'll, I'll give you a clue. It has to do with the Bible. Are you ready? No, seriously. It has to do with the Bible. I know what you're saying. So does everything else at church. Well, it does. This morning, uh, I've got a message, and I've told my kids, I think it was last night or this morning, I said, I've got, I've got a lot to say, and I don't have any more extra time to say it than normal, so I'm going to have to just say it fast. Actually, I had to cut a lot of this message out just because there's, there's a lot there. I'll give you a little bit of my thinking process. I, I've been reading through the Psalms, and I've been uh, taking about a day on each chapter. Not a whole day, like 24 hours, but about an hour a day on each chapter. And I've just been outlining it, writing things down that I learn. And it's been uh, taking sometimes an hour for me to get through a chapter. Sometimes it's taken a couple days. I'll have to come back to it. Well, this this week, I was going through Psalm chapter 81. I think that was yesterday morning, actually. I was doing that, and then I had on this, I'd had on my mind and on my heart a, a message. I wanted to preach about finishing well. I read through Psalms 81, and I thought, that just fits so very well. I put this message together, and a lot of the challenges, I came up with a starting verse, and then after putting seven pages of notes together, I still didn't have Psalms 81 worked into the outline. So I'm going to have to preach that a different time, but that was where we started. So I want you to go to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Now, I know it can be dangerous to get all your doctrine from the book of Ecclesiastes, but I want to give you a, a verse from here. Now, the crazy thing is, tonight I'm also preaching a message that has a lot to do with Ecclesiastes. Yeah, that's, that's just odd right there to get two messages in a row, but I think they're both going to be very helpful. Tonight, tonight is this, developing personal biblical standards about decision making. Developing personal biblical standards about decision making. This, is, this will be helpful for you. At the beginning of the year is a time where we make a lot of decisions. How are you going to make those decisions? What decisions are you going to make? And uh, well, I'm going to be, uh, tonight for sure, maybe over the next few weeks, preaching on, on making some of those decisions, developing some guidelines in our lives, some standards in our life for how to make decisions. I think that'll be helpful for you. But that's tonight, not this morning. If we, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 8. Here's our verse. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. You can read through the book of Ecclesiastes. You can see some interesting things, some depressing things, some frustrating things. But let me just take you to the end. I wasn't planning to do this, but you, you need to see this. It'll, this will tie it all together. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. This is the, the, the end answer for all the questions that Ecclesiastes asks. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So the goal of our studying Ecclesiastes needs to be this, needs to end up with, we've got to get back to God. We've got to live for God. We've got to do His will. All right, so with that in mind, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Looking through the focus of everything that I do needs to be according to God's will. Remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth, understanding that. All right, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Thereof. Isn't that an interesting thought? Interesting thought. Um, today's the last Sunday of this year. Today's the last Sunday of this decade. In a few days, we'll be starting a new year, and hopefully you're making some plans to start your new year right. We uh, took a quick survey. They didn't know we were doing this in Sunday school, but uh, 
I just asked some of the things that people are doing. And a lot of people are starting some, some things this year. Maybe reading our Bible. Maybe uh, some decisions that are needing to be made. Maybe you need to make a decision. A new year is a great time to do that. Any day is a great time to make a good decision. But sometimes a new year is just a good time to do that. But before you start your new year right, I want to challenge you to finish this year well. You need to finish this year well. Okay, so today's the, is it the 29th? December 29th. We've only got a few days to finish out the 2019 well, to finish out this whole decade well. And then we're going to have to start writing 2020 on everything that we write dates on. And it's going to confuse us. And first, we don't, we don't even write any checks anymore, right? Some of you write checks. Hopefully you write checks on Sunday mornings, right? That's a good time to write checks, hint, hint. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably write that wrong. We'll probably write 2019 and scratch out the 1-9 and write a 20 over it. And there's there's going to be some changes. I want to challenge you to start this year well. I want you to, I'm sorry, finish this year well. I also want to challenge you to finish well where you are right now. We are all in different stages of our life. And I'm going to preach to different stages. I'm going to preach to different groups of people and uh, and, and every group is a group that you were in or are in or will be in, most likely at some point. I want you to listen to this. I think it'll be helpful for you. The title this morning is simply Finish Well. First of all, our best example of finishing well is Jesus. You've got to start there. The Bible says that for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He finished well. Jesus asked God to take the cup of suffering away, but chose to accomplish God's will instead of what his human flesh desired. Jesus did his Father's will all the way to the cross. And on the cross, I believe it was a shout. I don't believe it was just a week almost barely coming out of his mouth, but the, the Bible says he said with a loud voice as he hung on the cross, it is, what did he say? Finished. Our best example of finishing well is Jesus. He completed his mission. He kept the faith. He finished his course. He died on the cross and I believe exploded from the grave. They didn't roll the stone back for him to get out. They rolled the stone back so they could get in to see that he wasn't there any longer. He finished his mission. Death was swallowed up in victory. First Corinthians, we have this written, No death, where is thy sting? No grave, where is thy victory? Why? Because Jesus finished well. Not only is He our Savior, but He's our example. And you can finish well because He finished well. I want to challenge you to finish well. Every one of us are in a different stage in our life. I mean, we may be similar, but there's going to be something different about every stage of our life. And you are in a different place than I am, but I want to challenge you to finish well where you are. You can... Oh, I wasn't done with, with, with Jesus finishing his race. I, I've got to just give you a little bit more about that. Now, he's not done. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. But his time on earth, well, you can live again. Why? Because he rose again. First uh, Corinthians 15, 20, the Bible says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Listen, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he wants to give you eternal life, and you can have eternal life because He died on the cross and rose again. He paid for your sins. He rose again as God. You can have abundant life because He gave His life. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Oh, you can finish well. You can have an abundant life. You can, you can have eternal life because Jesus came and He finished well. There's examples in the Bible of people who finished well. The, the one that I think of, you probably thought of this already, is the Apostle Paul. He said, and as he, he wrote the book of Timothy, that he finished his course. He compared his life to a race and he said, I'm finishing my course. Now I want you to understand, Paul was in a Roman prison. The Apostle Paul, the time that he wrote the second letter to Timothy, he had been abandoned by most of his friends. He knew he was about to die. And from that dark, wet prison, he wrote a letter to a young preacher named Timothy. And here's what he said. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What a great example of somebody finishing. Now go back with me for a minute and put yourself in Paul's mind and, and maybe think what he might have been thinking. 
All right, you're in jail. This is a, a Roman prison. The, the situation wouldn't have been nice like one of our jails today. You are in prison. Um, Paul, you're, you're in a dungeon waiting to be executed. Paul may have been thinking back over his life from the day he trusted Christ as a Savior. He had preached revivals. He'd traveled all over the known world. He had seen people saved in many different countries. He, he'd started churches. He'd been hated. He'd been arrested. He'd been stoned. He'd been falsely accused. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd written letters to churches all over Europe that eventually became part of the New Testament, part of the 66 books of the Bible. God inspired him to write those letters to those churches. He'd been used of God, abandoned by friends, arrested by fellow citizens, and encouraged by believers. And through all of that, he wrote this last letter and he said, I believe I'm finishing well. And he did. He finished well. Now picture yourself this morning standing before God at the end of your life and hearing God say, as Jesus said in Matthew 25, 21, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, you're not doing it. I want you to picture yourself there. Are you there? All right, picture yourself. I, I know you can't picture the throne of God, and I know you can't picture what heaven's like. The best you can. Picture yourself there, and you are hearing Jesus Christ himself, the one who died on the cross, the one who rose from the grave, the one who ascended up on high, the one who will be returning, and you are hearing him tell you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Can you picture him saying, oh, that's what I want. I want to get to the end of my life and, and stand before the judgment seat of Christ and hear the words, well done. Well done. You finished well. Now, Matthew 25, it was a parable. Jesus was telling a parable. And in the parable, there was a boss and there were some people that were given money. There supposed to invest well. And in that parable, the boss said, well done. He didn't say, well started or well thought about or good try. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The servant was good. He did the right thing. But the servant was also faithful. He didn't quit. Well done, thou good and faithful service. servant. You, you finished what I'd given to you to do. You can do that. Just do the right things and never quit. What a great formula for life. Just do the right things and never quit. Do what God calls you to do and never quit. I'm going to preach to some different groups here this morning, and I want to challenge you to finish well. Some of you this morning, you've been married for more than 40 years. How many of you have been married for more than 40 years? More than 40 years? I was trying to think of something snarky to say, but I couldn't think of anything, so I'm just going to keep on moving Good job. <laughs> Good job. Wow. Congratulations. Well, listen, you've been married for over 40 years. Now it's time to recommit, re-engage, reconnect. Don't, don't say, man, the, the best is behind us. What do we have to look forward to? I've, just, I, I've not been there. We've been married 22 years. But let me tell you something. Those of you that have been married 40 years, you set the example for us. You like the pace car in the Indy 500, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to follow you. We want to do what you have done. Keep going. Finish. Finish well. Some of you have been married for less than that. Finish well. Finish well. If you've been married from anywhere from less than a year to 40 years or more, listen, finish well. You, you can finish well. Invest your energy into becoming the best husband or the best wife that you can be. If you're married this morning, I want to challenge you. Make it your goal not only to finish, but to finish well. I know this is not every group this morning. I'm speaking to married people right now. But let me tell you, you can finish. And you can finish well, many marriages only last until the newness wears off. A few weeks, a few years. I was reading a news story about uh, one of the Hollywood stars, and his marriage lasted for four days. He went to Las Vegas and got drunk and got married, and four days later it was over. A lot of marriages only last until the newness wears off or until the beer wears off or whatever it was that they were drinking. Listen, finish well. Finish well. Many marriages only last until the kids move out. Then they don't have anything in common anymore. 
Finish well. Let me just, let me just challenge you. Finish well. Finish well to, to where you can go through all of life and you can keep those vows that you made. If you're married, commit to finish well. It's a decision. Because sometimes being married is the hard thing. Sometimes it's hard to get along. Sometimes it's hard to work things out. Sometimes it's hard to deal with another person who's a sinful person just like I am. But listen, do right and do right without quitting. Finish well. Some of your teenagers, I want to challenge you to finish your teen years well. Listen to me, teens. Finish your teen years well. I'm not talking about finishing your life yet, okay? We'll get to that in a little bit when we get you know, up there. But, but teens, if you finish your teen years well, then you're setting yourself up to finish your adult years well, and, and then you're setting yourself up to finishing your life well. But first, you've got to finish your teen years well. 1 Timothy 4.12, that, that uh, same person that Paul was writing the letter to from prison, he says this, Let no man despise thy youth. How many of you are teens this morning? You're somewhere between the age of 12 and 30. <laughs> no, 12 and, say 12 and 20. All right, somewhere in between there. Somewhere between 12 and 20. All right, so, so I, know, I, know, I, know, I know you're 18, like I'm an adult now. Wait, no, 18, 19, still teens, right? So, so you're, in that, you're in that age group. I'm specifically speaking to you, junior high and high school right now. Now, if you're in junior high and high school, if you will listen to me, Look at me for the next couple minutes and, and, listen, and learn something from me. Stop looking down at whatever you're writing and drawing and looking at it on your phone and whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, th those of you that just looked up, yes, that's you. Listen, I can help you. If you will listen to me, this will help you. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. And he goes on to say, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity... The Bible says if you're a teenager, God expects you to be an example of what being a Christian is all about. People should be able to look at you as a teenager and say, oh, that's what Christians are. That's what Christians are like. Teenager, listen, talk like a Christian should talk. Love like a Christian should love. Have a good spirit. Develop your faith in, in God. Stay physically pure, mentally pure. And emotionally pure. Teenagers, listen, this will help you. Don't watch shows with sex in it. Don't listen to music about sex. Don't hang out with teens that are having sex. I know I'm being very blunt here this morning. Teens, listen to me. Finish well. Finish well. If you ignore what I'm saying this morning, you're not going to finish well. Decide that you'll obey God and keep yourself pure for the person that you marry. Teens, oh, if I could... Those of you that decided to go ahead and, and write again and, and stop looking up here again, maybe a good idea for you to sit with your parents next time. All right? Listen to me. I'm trying to save your life. If you'll listen, you'll avoid the hurts. Finish well. Get rid of that attitude that says you're supposed to act like the world and get in trouble while you're a teenager. You're supposed to be setting the example. How many of you, okay, we go to, I love, at the right time of the day, in the right time of year, I like going to Sam's Club. Because there's samples at Sam's Club. In fact, we rename Sam's Club, we call it Samples Club. Because you can go in and you get free stuff. I love it. So when you go into Sam's Club or another place to give samples, you go in and you get a free sample. That sample, all right, so let's, let's pretend with me. You go into Sam's Club, and you get this free corn dog sample. I don't know why I picked corn dogs, but that's, that's what we picked, all right? You get a free corn dog sample. They got it in the little paper cup or the little paper plate right there. It's never the whole thing. It's like a little bitty piece. But, but it's supposed to be a, a, a sample of what the rest of them are like. So you get this idea. If I buy that box of corn dogs, it's going to be just like the little sample corn dog that I just had. Right? It's, a, it's a sample. It's an example. Teenagers, listen to me. When the world looks at you, they should see you as a little sample of what all Christianity is. You should represent what God sees and, and, and his, his, uh, his, uh, his goal, His ideals for what a Christian ought to be. You're a sample Christian. Everybody at your school should be able to look at you and know what Christians are supposed to be like. 
Everybody in your neighborhood should see the way you treat people and know how Christians treat people. Everybody that you connect with on social media should know how Christians are supposed to live based on, on, on you. Teenagers, listen, I beg you, I beg you would, you, would you make a decision? I'm going to finish my teen years well. I'm not just going to be the average teenager. The average teenager is in trouble. The average teenager hates their parents. The average teenager doesn't do a whole lot with their life. Sometimes ever, sometimes they wait till they're in their 20s or 30s and finally start doing something with their life. That doesn't have to be you. You can do something great for God now. You can finish your teen years well. As a teenager, you may not have started right, but you can finish right. Yes, absolutely, you can change your attitude. You can change the way you treat your authority. You can change the way you obey your parents. You can start reading your Bible. Teens, I beg you. I beg of you, would you start reading your Bible? Would you start every day spending some time reading your Bible? It'll change your life. It'll change your future. It'll help you to finish well. You may not have started right, but you can finish right. Teens, oh, listen to me. I'm almost done. Then you can go back to sleep. All right, listen. You can actually know God as a teenager. Seriously, as a teenager, you're 14, you're 15, 16, 18, as a 17, I don't want to miss you. As a teenager, you really can talk to God, know God, know what God likes, know what God doesn't like. You can actually have a real relationship with God. Absolutely. You can feel God's presence. You can enjoy the, the, uh, the relief of having the guilt taken off your shoulders when you confess your sins to God. What a life to live knowing God. Teen, that can be you. Finish well. You can have answers to your prayers. Teenager, listen. Decide today to finish your teen years well. You only get them once. Do, do it well. Do right and keep doing it. Do right and don't stop. Just, just, just keep doing right and finish well. Some of you are single adults. This is the time of your life when you'll make the decisions that will impact your life the most. Single adults, you'll probably choose a career during this time of your life. You'll probably choose a college or a trade school or apprenticeship or something like that that will train you for your career. You'll most likely, single adults during this time of your life, you'll most likely choose who you marry. You'll choose what you believe. You'll choose what you're going to teach your children. Single adults, listen, this time of your life will be short, but it will determine almost everything about the rest of your life. This, this is a short time of life for some people. Sometimes it's longer for others. It can vary. But this could be a very short time of life from just four years to, to, to eight years, maybe 10 years, maybe 30 years. It depends how long, how long God has for you. I mean, God's plan is different for everybody. I understand that. But this potentially could be a very short time in your life where a lot of really important things need to happen. Some of you are just entering this part of your life. Some of you are almost done with this part of your life. Whichever side of single adulthood you're on, I want to challenge you this morning. Finish well. Finish well. Do the right thing and just keep on doing it. Don't stop. Finish well preparing for your career. If you're a single adult, this is huge for you. Make a commitment to do God's will for your life no matter what it is. Could you just do that? It's like, okay, I'm talking to single adults. They don't even know what a checkbook is, right? But let's pretend with me here. It's like taking a check, signing the bottom of it, and saying, God, here's my life. You fill out how much, and you fill out to who. I've already signed it, and I'm giving it to you. And, uh, so so uh, single adults, it's like, it's like giving God your, your credit card or your debit card. It's like giving God your Apple Pay and saying, you spend it however you want, all right? You spend it however you want to spend it. That's, that's my life. Make a commitment to do God's will, no matter what it is. Don't, don't do this. Don't say, God, if you show me your will, I'll do it if I like it. No. Say, God, I'll do your will. I promise you that. Now just show me and I'll do it. Prepare completely. Don't quit. Let me encourage you. Some of you 
Some of your friends have lots of free time and extra money. Some of them have already gotten married. Their life looks tempting. Finish well preparing for your career. Finish well preparing for what God has called you to do. Don't take shortcuts. Finish your preparation years well. Finish well your years of being single. It may seem like forever, but it happens fast. Single adults, make a commitment to be a pure virgin when you step up to the altar to get married. Make that commitment. Teens make the same commitment, but single adults, listen, there's so many temptations to give up your purity now. You're getting closer to being maybe married, if that's what God has for you. And as you get closer to that, the temptations, they, they rise and they ratchet tighter and tighter. Just, just decide, I'm going to stay pure. I'm going to do God's will. I'm not going to quit. The wait's worth it. Single adults, finish your single years well. I know we want to finish life well. And we'll get to that in just a minute, but let's take each little piece. Wherever you are right now, let me challenge you, finish that well. Finish being a teenager well, and then move up to being an adult, and you can look back and say, I have no regrets. Oh, wouldn't it be great to move to the next stage of life and say, I have no regrets. Oh, to be able to look back and say, God, I, I did your will the best I could. I, I have no regrets. Some of you are somewhere between a young adult and an old adult. I couldn't figure out any other way to say that. You're somewhere between a young adult and old adult. And I'm not going to define that. You just figure that out yourself, right? Somewhere, somewhere in there, right? You're, you're, you're going through what uh, people would call midlife. You're going through the, 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 the biggest part of life. So much of life happens right there. Somewhere between being a young single adult and, and somewhere between being an old adult, wherever that happens. It's a fictional number that happens up there somewhere in the future. But somewhere in there, a lot of life happens. There's raising kids. There's having a career. There's serving God. In every stage that you enter in, finish well. Finish well. This is most, most adults here this morning. Don't quit on your kids. Don't quit on your marriage. Don't quit serving God. Don't quit trying to reach the world with the gospel. Finish well. If you feel the need to have a midlife crisis, do it well. Have the best midlife crisis anybody's ever had. Buy the reddest sports car, buy the loudest motorcycle, or buy the biggest llama farm. Something. Just do it the best, right? Finish. Okay, that was supposed to be funny. Finish well. Listen, none of us are guaranteed a long life. We don't know how long we have. Tonight in our message about decisions, we'll, we'll see that from Ecclesiastes. We're not guaranteed a long life. None of us are guaranteed to live to the age of retirement. None of us are guaranteed to live to the age of having grandkids or great-grandkids. I mean, I hope we do, but no, none of us have that guarantee. We look around, we see some of the older saints here today, and don't you like how people call you older saints once you get older? It's like midlife, pff, you're not a saint. But older, pff, you're saints now. You look around and you see some folks that are older, and, and you think, man, when, my, when I get there, wait a minute, we're not guaranteed to get there. What I'm saying is, let's live our life the very best we can. Finish where you are now and finish well. Do your best every day to prepare to stand at the judgment seat of Christ so you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Some of you are older than 70. Listen, finish well. Finish well. I just picked 70, kind of a random round number. At 70... Cornelius Vanderbilt began buying railroads. You ever heard of him? Railroad tycoon didn't start until he's 70 years old. At 71 years old, there's a Japanese name, and I'm going to not say it the way I probably should. I'm going to try. Katsusuki Yanagisawa, all right, 71 years age, a retired Japanese school teacher, became the oldest person to climb Mount Everest. You can still climb Mount Everest. Well, she could. He, she could still climb Mount Everest. At 75, cancer survivor Barbara Hillary became one of the oldest person and the first black woman to reach the North Pole. At 77 years old, John Glenn became the oldest person to go to space. Listen, keep going. Don't
don't, don't, don't get to a point where you say, ah, I'm just going to coast now. I'm just going to throw it all away. No, no, just, just keep going. Finish well. Some of you are older than 80. Finish well. At 80, Christine Brown from California flew to China and climbed the Great Wall of China. I'm not saying you have to do this. I'm just saying it's not over just because you're 80, all right? All right, so, so I, I, I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to keep going. I want to encourage you to just keep on serving. Give God the very best you've got wherever you are. Bill Painter was 81 years old when he was, became the oldest person to reach the summit of Mount Rainier, 14,411 feet climbing glaciers. When William Baldwin was 82 years old, he became the oldest tightrope walker crossing the South Boulder Canyon in Colorado. He walked across a 320-foot tightrope wire. He's 82 years old. Alan Stewart was 91 when he completed a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of New England. Paul Spangler was 92 when he finished his 14th marathon. That's a long ways to run. I don't know his time, but he finished. Taichi Igarashi was 99 years old when he climbed Mount Fuji. Frank Shearer, I'm not sure I'll say Shearer, was 100 years old and actively water skiing. He decided I'm I'm going to do something when I turn 100 years old is I'm going, to, I'm going to go water skiing. I used to do it when I was younger. I'm going to go. He took up water skiing again. I'm not sure how long ago that was. The point is this. Don't stop living for God. Don't start coasting. Don't give in to temptation to live for yourself. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Would you go to Hebrews chapter 12 with me this morning? I wish I had time to take you to Psalms. That's going to have to be a whole other message. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. We're running a race. We don't know where we are in the race. For some, of it's, for some of us, it's going to be a marathon. For some of us, it's going to be a sprint. We don't know. We don't know how long this race is, but listen, I want to challenge you this morning. Keep your eye on the finish line. Keep your eye on the prize. Don't stop. Don't go to one side or don't go to the other side. Don't fall off the path onto either ditch on the side. Keep going. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Hebrews 12, 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. There it is. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The only way to finish well is to keep your eye on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Run your race. Don't stop. Lay aside the weights and sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus. One day you'll see Him in person, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And listen, for everybody in this room, it's not that far away. Seriously. We read history about George Washington. You read history about Abraham Lincoln. You read history about these, these great guys of Civil War and all that. And, and 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that's not that long ago in history, but those guys have been in heaven for a long time. It goes fast. In 100 years, unless you live to be older than the oldest person, which was, I think, 124 years old, every person, every one of us, will be in the presence of God. It's going to happen faster than we realize. So what I want you to do today, I want you to kind of refocus and say, as I'm finishing this year, as I'm finishing this decade, I want to make sure that I'm finishing well. I want to finish this year well. I want to finish this decade well. I want to finish being a teenager well. I want to finish being a young adult well. I, I want to finish being a middle something adult well. I want to finish being a, a senior adult well. I want to finish my marriage well. I want to do all these things. And I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. I want to do it well. Some of you are older than 70. Some of you are older than 80. Some of you are older than dirt. Finish well. Finish well. 
Hey, let me tell you something. I was, I, I'm, I'm, Brother John, I'm not going to try to embarrass you, but I was so thankful. I was so thankful. Tuesday morning, Brother John gave me a call. He said, John, you're 86. Brother John's 86 years old. He said, Pastor, listen. If you need anybody to go up to the hospital and visit Miss Lupe, let me know. I'll go with you. Don't stop. Don't stop serving God. You can be an encouragement to somebody no matter where you are. Brother John, you encouraged me. You motivated me. You challenged me. I appreciate that. Some of you have pastored churches. Brother Di, I told you I was coming for you. Served on mission fields. Taught Sunday school classes for decades. We're so honored to have pastors, retired pastors in our church. Pastor Blake, Pastor Di. What an honor to be able to have them here in our church. Listen, you've done this. You've pastored. You've maybe served on mission fields. Some of you have taught Sunday school classes for longer than I've been alive. You might feel like your best days are behind you. You might feel like you aren't useful to God like you used to be, but that's not true. Your ministry is just different now, but it's just as important. Stay faithful. To some of you who have been serving God for longer than I've been able to walk, <laughs> longer than I've been alive, some of you have been uh, in a ministry, pastoring, serving. You've spent a lifetime getting to know God. You have wisdom that needs to be passed down. Pastor Blake, Pastor Di, maybe others that I just don't realize, but listen, you've forgotten more than most of us have ever learned. <laughs> Keep growing, though. Keep learning. Keep teaching. Keep inspiring. Keep writing. I want to encourage you to be a bridge builder, and I know both of you know this poem, but I'm going to read it for everybody else. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been as naught to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim, Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. Keep on going. Keep building bridges. Keep teaching. Keep, keep learning. Keep growing. Keep writing what you know and what you've learned for the rest of us to learn. Some of you are college students. Some of you are Bible college students. <laughs> and you're in financial trouble. Every one of these sentences I'm about to say ends with trouble. <laughs> or in your relationship trouble. Or you're having grade trouble. Or you're having roommate trouble. Or you're facing health trouble. Or you're experiencing dating trouble. <laughs> or dealing with homesickness trouble. Or you're stressing out over what you're going to do with your life. If you're in college and you go to school away from home, every one of those things will describe your life at some point along your journey. You're probably dealing with many of those things right now. Listen, if God led you to where you are now, then finish well. Don't quit. Never quit in doubt what God led you to start by faith. God's molding you and making you into the person that He knows you can be. He knows you can be better than you ever imagined you can be. God sees greater potential for your life than you do. I know you're going through hard times. I've been in those hard times. The hard times you're going through right now are preparing you for the great times you'll experience later. But you have to let God finish what God started. I still have stressful dreams from my years in Bible college. I really, I wake up thinking I'm back in Bible college some days. 
I know any college can be stressful. My experience is Bible college, so that's what I'm going to share with you. I am waking up, and I'm walking into chapel on the first day of classes. I'm wearing a gray sports coat with pink and blue herringbone pattern, and my one black tie. And I'm so scared, I'm about to throw up on the first day going into Bible college, and I wake up, and that's the dream, my recurring dream that I keep having. I still have stressful dreams from Bible college. I dream I'm married to, to Jen, but I'm living in the men's dorms, and she's living in the ladies' dorms. We see each other about two minutes every day between classes, and we have to keep the rules for single students that are living in the dorms. And, and I wake up in a cold sweat, and I, whew, okay, it's just a dream. Why? Well, that time of life was stressful. That time of life was very formative. It was a changing time of life. But it was in Bible college I learned to trust God to provide the money I needed. And I learned how to pray for God to supply the money. It was in Bible college I learned to face rejection and reality. I had my first date with a girl that I didn't want to have a date with in Bible college. First date ever. But I couldn't get a second date with any girls that I did want to have a date with. And I learned how to pray for God to lead me to His perfect will for my life. It was so stressful and scary. It was in Bible college I learned how to deal with uncomfortable situations and inconsistent bosses and horrible work schedules and unrealistic deadlines and unfriendly people and debilitating fatigue. And you could go on and on, but God used all of those things to prepare me for being a Christian in the real world. I learned that God's the only source of strength and sanity and comfort, direction, and friendship that will never let me down. Listen, if God's led you to Bible college, finish well. Stay where God puts you until you finish preparing to be and to do what He has planned for you to be and to do. I don't know what stage of life you're in. I can, I can guess some. I don't know all the details, though. Let me say this. Finish well what God led you to start. Finish well. Wherever you are on the journey God has you on, finish well. Finish this part of your journey well. Don't worry about finishing everything well yet. Just finish right now well. Finish your marriage well. I mean, don't finish it like cut it off and say, well, well done. No, stay with it. Finish it. Stay there. Finish well. Finish the stage you have raising kids. Finish that, but finish it well. Finish whatever stage you are in life. Finish it well. Don't just finish. Finish well. I'm almost done. A riverboat was going down the Mississippi, taking a load of cotton down to uh, New Orleans where they were going to sell it. I may be going backwards. I think cotton went up. and uh, They're taking a load down, down south. The riverboat was going down the river, and as it was... Traveling down the river, another riverboat came in from a branch of the river, and they got next to each other, and a friendly competition started. And there were some words said between the two riverboats, and you know what a riverboat is, right? The big boat, big wheels, either on the side or in the back of it to propel it down the Mississippi River. Starts up north, goes down south to the Gulf of Mexico. These riverboats are, are going down side by side. Some words are exchanged, like, your mama wears combat boots. You know, something like that. I don't know what it was. Or, or, uh, or our boat's faster than your boat. Or, or something like that. Or where'd you find that thing? And I don't know what the words were. Words were extreme. You know, trash talk. Hope I didn't offend anybody by your mama wearing combat boots. Uh, that's what they said when I was a kid. <laughs> Just thought about that. Um, so they decided they're going to have a race. We're going to settle this thing once and for all. And they started loading wood into the, into the fire steamboat to get those wheels spinning as fast as they could, and they started racing down the river. They were going to see which steamboat was the fastest, which crew was the fastest. They were going to get those river boats down the river. Well, they burned up so much fuel so fast before they got to their destination that they started looking for anything else that would burn. And they started unloading the very things, the very products that they were trying to take down that they were going to get paid for when they delivered them. Let's throw this bale of cotton in. That'll burn. Let's throw this in. That'll burn. And in, in, in the process of, of racing, they, they, they ended up getting to the finish line, but by the time they got to the finish line, they had burned up everything that they were trying to deliver there. Don't let that be your life. You can finish. We all can finish. But are you finishing well? 
Don't waste those things God has given you. I want you to make some decisions. We're done. Some decisions. What do I need to do to finish where I am well? How can I finish this year well? Did I make a promise to somebody that I haven't kept? Did I make a promise to God that I haven't kept? Have I made a decision that I turned back from sometime during this year and I just need to re-engage and, and let God relight my spirit and relight that fire to serve Him?